connection uh, with Dr. Givenji Gitahi, Global CEO, AMREF Health Africa. He's as well a board member, Africa CDC. Dr. Givenji, always a pleasure to have you here on KTN Prime. Now, just straight into it, the WHO now terming uh, coronavirus as a possible endemic, a virus that may never go away and we might have to learn how to live with it. What does that mean for us as Kenyans? Yeah, thank you, Akisa, for having me. Um, what it means is when the WHO says that uh, coronavirus is, pan is a pandemic to begin with, what it means is that you have multiple epidemics in very many countries. That's how it becomes a pandemic. But then um, those multiple epidemics can then become endemic. Endemic means that in an epidemic, you're saying it's, a quick, it's an outbreak, an, an increase in disease among people within a very short time. Endemic means it's now within the community or, or the population that we are dealing with and may, just like the flu, come up, go down, come up, go down. And we have many diseases that are endemic in Africa, you know, influenza or flu. Malaria is probably one of the most common endemic diseases. It's here with us. You treat it, goes away, then you get it again. Uh, HIV is also endemic now because it's here with us and there is no uh, vaccine in, in sight so far. Um, so it means that we'll have to accept the disease with us and then take the necessary measures to um, keep it at bay, just like we do for HIV and just as we do for malaria. What are some of these measures then that we need to start thinking about that will go a long way in just helping us adjust into a number of new normals? I think the first thing is to think from a science um, uh, point of view, uh, the acceleration of the availability of a vaccine available to all people everywhere within the time that's required would help us to probably break the cycle and uh, stop the disease from becoming endemic. So the scientists racing towards the vaccine would help us to stop it from being pandemic. The next thing is obviously we found a cure, you know, med uh, medicines that would help us to control the disease. But most importantly, from our point of view, mm. it is to reduce the transmission. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, the various ways of, of doing this is that we want to ensure that you reduce the rate of transmission from one person to another. We know the coronavirus is carried by people. It doesn't travel on its own. So mobility, the movement of people, reducing the movement of people is one way to deal with the endemic disease because it means that people will still get infected, but at a slower rate, because the biggest challenge is having a boom of infections and therefore having so many people who require hospitalization and then it may collapse the health system and you may be unable to provide for them. So we have to continue social distancing. We have to continue the hand washing, which is obviously a good behavior, not only for Corona, but also for pneumonia, for cholera, for all the other diseases. Mm -hmm. And we may need to find a way of how to protect the vulnerable and continuously find ways of, um, keeping the infection low. But remember, whatever we do, even at that rate, is just a, the dimension of time that may take longer, but eventually a significant part of the population will be infected. Some studies uh, believe up to 60% mm -hmm. of the population without a vaccine mm -hmm. will eventually get infected by coronavirus. But over what period of time, uh, that is up to debate. But even with these measures of, uh, you know, controlling movement, social distancing and whatnot, we continue to do that. Countries continue to do that. But at some point, the world will have to open up. What should we anticipate? We anticipate that the world is going to open up, yes. Um, and we anticipate that social distancing will have to be compatible with, uh, with active economies. So we have to find a way of making social distancing compatible. So there will be things that will change. Uh, things that will change will be, of course, we always, you know, we will have to worry about uh, the vulnerable, meaning that, uh, you know, people who are above 60 may have hypertension and diabetes. We have to find ways mm -hmm. of protecting them or ring fencing them and making sure that they are not at, uh, at big risk. For the other active part of the society to reduce the transmission, remember that if you have one person and you have a group of what we call susceptible people who have mm -hmm. not had contact with the virus before. That person can infect up to four people. Those four people can infect up to four people. Now, for you to stop infection, if you slow down the movement of the one person with the virus, then it is likely they will not infect four people because mm -hmm. therefore reducing mobility is important. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two is that um, you may find that we'll have to, based on that theory, that whenever there is an outbreak in an area, 
we would have to kind of close it out so that you reduce it and you control the impact. So these closures of regions may continue with us for a long time, even if it's not a total economy lockdown. Closing down like what you're seeing now, Kenya doing with this Lee, with Old Town, that may continue for some time. The next thing is about reducing the numbers of people that you find congregated. So going back to huge meetings, conferences, may be something that we are not going to see for a very long time. Uh, obviously, then you will see behavior change. Even if we were to go back to, uh, to places of worship, you may see rules and regulations about how many people can be in a particular building based on its size. So there could be regulations around the number of people can be admitted into one particular place. That will apply to restaurants, will apply to schools, which is going to be difficult because, of course, with uh, free uh, education, we have huge numbers of young people going together in the same place. So you may have to see applying areas of hand washing and continuous disinfection. These are going to be common features in our lives. Experts, uh, especially health, health experts, are now advising that we may need to make some adjustments to our lifestyle and diet because of uh, boosting our immunity. Talk to us about that. Well, I think that the conversation around immunity is not new. I think the conversation around uh, having a good diet we were taught in primary school that having a good diet is a good thing, not only for corona. It is a good thing for your own health. It's a good thing for cholera. It's a good thing for malaria. It's a good for any other disease will require a strong immunity. In fact, there are studies now that believe that women have a slightly better immunity than men, and that's why they are, uh, you know, they are less infected by coronavirus. I've seen some studies like those. So immunity is something that is not about corona. It has to continue. So I think, um, you know, continuing to advise people to eat well, not only for corona, but for everything else, is an important thing to do. Uh, but in terms of other behavior change, handshaking may be a thing of the past. You know, we may find that it adds no value. Uh, other things that will, be, uh, will change is hand washing, which we have talked to people about for a very long time. Uh, you know, only less than 50% of people actually have consistent hand washing in Kenya. This may now rise to 80, 90% because people adopt it as a new way of life. People will uh, have to adopt better lifestyle, less drinking of alcohol, less smoking, because we have seen that people who take alcohol consistently and smoke are more likely to have diseases that uh, make them more vulnerable uh, to coronavirus, uh, uh, as it were. So these are things that will change our, uh, our lifestyles significantly. You've mentioned, the other thing that yes. you find... Yes, just it is up. obviously, even in areas like public transport, we'll have to change. You know, the way we now congest in one vehicle, we'll have to change. If it becomes endemic and we have to manage this social distancing, there'll be regulations about how many people can be carried in a vehicle. There'll be regulations about how many people can enter an aeroplane. So ticket prices for aeroplanes will definitely have to go up because now you can carry fewer people than you could in the past. So all these things are things we need to prepare ourselves for. You've mentioned that um, some studies show that women have, you know, better immunity, hence could be the reason why we're getting more men infected with coronavirus. You have written about male above 60 years of uh, age being among the most vulnerable. How do we safeguard this, groups, uh, this group uh, particularly? And talk to us about the spreaders that you mentioned are between the age of 20 and 40. How do we go about it? So in every particular disease, there are people who are, you know, in epidemiology, call them super spreaders, people who infect others in a very rapid way. If you look at something like uh, cholera, for example, and you may have somebody who is cooking for people in a restaurant and they have cholera, they can spread it to very, very many people, but they are the carriers, okay? Now, in this particular case, if you are to look at, um, at, at, at uh, COVID-19, we know that mobility plays a very big factor in spreading the disease. It's like the speed of mobility increases the speed of transmission. If you have one person who is going to meet 100 people in a day, shaking their hands, interacting with them, then it's likely that a lot of the people he meets or a good percentage of them will get infected. That's the same reason why we have seen home clusters. You know, you get a, somebody who is infected, they go home and they eventually they infect their children, their relatives. So this, but when, so when you now slow down the movement of those people, you find that you have less transmission. So if you are to look at the segment of the population and you look at who are the most mobile people, it's the active working people, 20 to 40 years, for example. And if you see the numbers of infected people in Kenya, 
about 70% of them, I think it's 76 if I'm not wrong, or even higher, are within that bracket of 20 to 40 years. Why? Because they are highly mobile. They are moving. They are interacting with others. So this is why I was using the term spreader for this category, because they are the ones then who then go back home and they find their elderly parents or grandparents or relatives, and then who are probably at home for the whole week. They haven't moved, and therefore they transfer the virus. Mm. So this is the correlation I was trying to make, that we need to realize that our movements may not put us, may put us at risk of infection, may not put us at risk of severe disease, but will put our people that we live with in severe disease because they are vulnerable. They are above 60 years, and they are male, and they, are, and male, they may have hypertension or diabetes. So we must remember that the vulnerability is in that group and we must protect them ourselves even before the government can come to say what measures need to be taken, which is why you reflect when the government said stop rural urban and urban rural migration. Yeah. It was a way to protect these people because right. that's where they that's where they belong. Yeah. So we have to keep well, well put. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight. Uh, very good conversation there, Dr. Gedinja Getahi, a global CEO, Amref Health Africa, just helping us dissect some of the issues and what are some of the adjustments that we might need to make as a people, even as uh, we continue to tackle the coronavirus. Now, away from that,